Okay, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Jada Bell podcast. I am your host, Jada. This is episode... 13, I believe, and we're still in season one. And I'm very grateful for all of the phenomenal guests that I've had on all of season one. I had some friends come on. I had guests come on. I had people like the To Be Better podcast coming on talking about communication and talking about some very real marital issues. I had great the great Holy Gabbana come on talking about you know, renewing of his mind and becoming a Christian after being a criminal. And I also had Marquette Devon on, and he is a very intellectual person. He answered so many questions that were so important to me. I have just been over the top blessed, you guys, for every guest that I've had on. And this is just season one, just 13 episodes. And we have already 100,000 followers on Instagram, almost 10,000 listeners on Spotify and Apple Podcasts combined. And this is all thanks to the glory of God. I didn't know where this podcast would take me at all. I started it because, as you guys know, speaking out against like the feminist movement and modern day feminism and how I believe that it is an attack on the nuclear family. It's an attack on women. It's an attack on men. Um, And with that, I opened up a door of just talking about mental health issues and talking about, you know, other ways the enemy has really just deceived us. And so this episode, as you guys can probably see by the title, this podcast episode is a sensitive conversation, and I'm aware of that. And I want everybody to know that when I'm speaking about this, I prayed I spoke to the Lord. I This is something heavy on my heart and why it's tugging on me so much. And I did a lot of research from a biblical standpoint and then a scientific standpoint. And why it is so dear to my heart is because right now it's the most influential issue in the presidential election of 2024. And I've been speaking a lot more on my platform about my political beliefs. But my biggest standpoint is that right now you see people fighting for a cause that is a little deceptive. And I think that it's important to bring in God and God's word in this conversation. I'm specifically speaking for believers. We have a lot of pro-choice believers. And I wanted just to give you guys my perspective and my point of view. Mind you as well, with this episode, this is in no way any harm or hurt towards anyone. It's not attack on anyone. God is good. We live in a broken, fallen world. These things are going to happen. I am very aware of that. You cannot go around and just stop wickedness or stop things from happening. It happens. Again, I speak speak about feminism and I speak about modern day feminism, the sexual revolution and how that's impacted our minds today, how that's impacted these things today. And this is another issue um, that is a direct result from feminism, the the sexual revolution. And so I'm going to get into it today. We're going to talk about abortion. And again, please say a prayer before you watch this episode. Pray, ask God to open up your heart and your mind to this conversation because it's a very deep conversation. Even the research that I was doing it, my heart was breaking. I was There's so much that was exposed to me that things I've already known, but then I went farther in depth into it. And This can be triggering for some people. This can upset some people. Not my intention, but, you know, you're going to offend some people when you're speaking the truth. Within that being said, I have my notes here so I don't get off track. But um, one revelation and and that I had received is that being pro-choice is three things. And this is why God put really heavy on my heart that being pro-choice is not an option for me anymore. Um, Because one, it's being silent during a genocide. Uh, And I'll break all of these downs and all these points down. Number two, it's supporting an abomination and it's shedding of innocent blood. And number three, it's being naive to the fact that abortion is a modern day repeat of the pagan sacrifice to Molech. And so within this episode, I'm going to break down why all of those revelations were made clear to me when it came to this subject and this topic of abortion. The first lie that we are told or that I believed was that it's not a genocide, it's women's health care. Right. And so when I asked the very question that I'm going to answer for you is how is it a genocide and not women's health care? Well, data shows that over a million women per year in America has an abortion. Over 22 million unborn babies have been aborted in the last 20 years. Right. And that's just in the last 20 years. 
it's not a coincidence that roughly the same amount of Jews were killed in the Holocaust. And now why make that con- p- comparison? That is so extreme, Jada. How are you going to compare abortion to what happened to the Jews? Well, this is something very fascinating, very shocking um, information that I came across is that my Pristone, which is the first abortion pill that you take, the chemical abortion pill, also known as RU486, is connected to the manufacture of the deadly gas called Zyklon B, which was used in World War II concentration camps. So it's not a coincidence that these things are connected. Ivepristone was developed, just for some extra information, if you guys want to fact check me or look more into it, Ivepristone was developed by a French drug company that was owned by a German company that helped manufacture the Zyklon B. And just some more insight about how crazy that is. That was used as a pesticide. Zyklon B was used as a pesticide for very many years. And then they experimented and, and made it a gas into uh, to put it into these concentration camps and it would suffocate the Jews. And so the fact that this is connected to the chemical abortion pill It was a very clear indication and a sign to me that what is going on is like a modern day Holocaust. If you don't know too much about the abortion pill and the the process, when you're taking the chemical abortion pill, my first stone, the first pill that is used, makes the uterus uninhabitable for the fetus and it dies. Um, And then the second pill forces the baby out, which also, you know, side effects are cramping and a lot of bleeding. So it is a painful process. It's not, we can be kind of naive to the process thinking it's, it's women's health care. It's a, it's an easy thing. It's, it's not that big of a deal, but a lot of women actually have also come out and talked about how much it impacted them mentally as well, and that they regret their decision and they felt like they had no other choice. And a lot of women are coming out talking about this, but it's being suppressed. Not only that, but a lot of abortionists as well, doctors are coming out and talking about the process and the graphic process, even in the first trimester, they see a little 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 body parts and i'm excuse me for being graphic but a lot of people are coming out saying this and this is being suppressed media doesn't want you to hear this they don't want you to know these things the second lie right that i believed even as well and i I just wanted to shed light because again this could we could be naive and speaking to believers as well we can be naive when it comes to being like pro-choice is that we're arguing for these rare cases like i always hear people are pro-choice what about you know rape cases incident cases they're very young well who is generally having these abortions right in 2020 women from the ages 20 to 29 according to the cdc where they made up for 61% of the abortions. Actually, unmarried women made up for 86% of abortions. And the three main reported reasons for abortion were, one, having a baby would drastically change my life. It would interfere with work. It would interfere with school right now. The second one was that you can't afford a baby right now. And a lot of these women were reported being in college, being in school. Another one is that I don't want to be a single mother. Mind you, 86% are unmarried women. So it's out of the inconvenience of not having like the help or the support. When I looked up, okay, who is like very, very young having abortions? What are those cases looking like? Ages 15 and younger were 0.3%, you guys, 0.3%. That is dramatically low amount of 15, the ages 15 and younger that are having abortions, that are getting pregnant, having abortions. And then 40 and up, where you are at health risks, you might have to have that intervene because it puts you at risk uh, for health issues was only 3.7%. So, and I believed I'm, I'm very being very naive if I think that this is women's health care. It's a, it's a naive statement, right? Because the majority of people that are having them is because it's a direct result It's a direct result of the radical feminist movement, the sexual revolution. It's a direct result from them eliminating the man out of the house, saying that not prioritizing marriage anymore, saying we could just be promiscuous. We can go have sex with whoever, whenever. But like I talked about in a different episode, women are at so much greater risk they're at so much greater risk every time they lay down with a man, not just from committing the crime of having an abortion. 
you know, having to go and and make that an option in your life. But also you're at greater risk of contracting an STD than men. Women have uh, um, uh, health, uh, mental health issues after participating in hookup culture or every time they lay down with the man that they're not married to. They have um, studies have shown that they have mental health issues after they're depressed, after the regret is higher. Um, they have uh, bonding hormones. It's different than when it, it, it's a man. So studies, science has proven that time and time again. And so again, one of the results of the sexual revolution and this pr promiscuous, hypersexualized culture is that now we are having an abortion. And so we, th we don't feel guilt. We don't feel shame. We don't go repent. Is that we're told that it was never a baby. The third lie is that, let me put my notes right here, you guys. Um, the third lie is that it's not a life yet. Now, I specifically want to speak to, you know, believers when I say this, and even if you are not, I once also was very pro-choice. I was, you know, do as you please. But when I started to grow my walk with God, these scriptures were very, very clear to me that God is so much bigger than just what you see and in that ultrasound, right? In Psalms 139, verses 13 through 16, I want to read this to you guys. It says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. You knitted me together. And as someone who watched my sister, you know, through her pregnancy, I watched my best friends through their pregnancy, how fast a human life grows. You know, I had my sister download this app when she first found out she was pregnant. She was a little scared, you know, and she's vocalized that on her platform that she was scared when she found out she was pregnant. She downloaded this app where you're able to see like, okay, your baby's the size of this. Now your baby's the size of that. And she saw how rapid her baby grew within three, four, five weeks. Like, Mommy, I have fingernails now, you know? And she's like, what? I'm still in like the first trimester. Verse 16, if you skip over to verse 16, it says, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordo ordained for me were written in the book before one of them came to be. God saw that baby before it was ever formed. So as a believer, saying that you're pro-choice or even believing the lie that's not a baby, well, God says it was before it ever came to be. You know, if if I wasn't here, I have a purpose being here. And that's something that God made very clear to me when I read that scripture is that if I was never here, I wouldn't have been able to speak to so many women to help their marriages. I wouldn't have been able to speak to so many women to help them through certain circumstances. Um, everything was laid out before I was ever here. And for those that may not read the Bible or scriptures, just some scientific facts is that a baby's heartbeat can begin at th three weeks, very, very, very fast, right? And a baby's organs are developed 10 weeks in after that it's just the brain and the spinal that has to you know keep developing throughout the uh throughout the pregnancy but this baby grows e exceptionally fast it's not just oh whenever the baby can now live outside the womb like this baby's organs heartbeat everything fingernails fingers it grows so so fast so it's a lie it was a lie to say that it's not a life Pro-choice argues to do what's best for you and what will make you happy, which is a selfish and self-centered mentality that radical feminists pushed that resulted into a promiscuous, hypersexualized society, which led to high divorce rates, fatherless homes, and now abortion cases are skyrocketing. In 1 John 2, 16, it says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. One thing that made very clear to me, because right now we're living in a society that is very selfish, it's not self-sacrificing. We're honestly very coddled. That's something God made very apparent to me. We're very coddled. There were times where people were actually going through so much suffering. We live in such a time where so many things are at our disposal. Um, more help than what women back then did not get. And I'm not saying that not everybody does, but what made, it really touched my heart and, and, and made 
my decision to change on this is that God says that it's going to be a hard life. It's it, it's not promised it was going to be easy. In fact, if you look at the disciples that followed Jesus and how, you know, they died, <laughs> nearly all of them died in the most gruesome ways. And I can put aside myself and my own selfishness and what I think would make me happy for the betterment of what God wants me to do. And that's the beauty of being a Christian is being selfless and self-sacrificing and doing the the walk with God and finding purpose in the hard things. So saying, you know, do what's best for you is actually the opposite of the walk that God wants us to live. If I could do what's best for me, I probably wouldn't even get on here. I would just keep my mouth shut and stay quiet because I don't want to offend anybody. I just want to keep the peace. Jesus didn't say that either. So being a believer and being pro-choice is quite, you know, contradictory to each other. And there's people that don't have to be a Christian or a believer, have a different religion and just see like, this is not, this is not right. Like there's something off about this. And every time something really starts expanding wildly, it's important to start questioning it. How did this become so normalized so fast? Even Joe Biden and the Democratic Party, Joe Biden himself and Hillary Clinton said that they want to keep abortions as rare as possible. Joe Biden said it's always a tragedy when an abortion abortion has to occur and that's what it was for many years this is new this is a new way of thinking because i don't remember this and i'm not that old i'm only 25 i don't remember growing up in a time where it was so normalized you could see tiktok videos where women are like oh healthcare, putting on a face mask while taking an abortion pill making them food and making it a whole just glamorized self-care thing it's always always a tragedy it was always sad everybody knew what it was people some people had to do it you know you pray for them and you know that their circumstances led to that whatever may may be the be you try to offer your support your condolences and a lot of love for them now it's become where our hearts are so cold you guys it's so cold that there's that we're losing humanity we're losing touch with humanity to the point where if i say what i'm saying right now i'm called stupid and insulted for saying what I'm saying right now. That's crazy for having compassion and thinking about the life of a, a, an unborn child. I'm in, I'm called crazy, stupid, I don't care, etc. So, the Bible speaks about infanticide, infanticide, and baby sacrifice. Actually, in quite a few passages, this has been going on for quite some time, and. It was a part of a pagan sacrifice, one being the worship of Molech, an idol. You guys can look up pictures of it if you want to. Uh, it spooked me out, but it's an idol with the face of a calf whose hands are open like this. And in Jeremiah 32, 32, it said the people of Israel, God's own people, which broke his heart and Judah, their kings, their officials, their priests, their prophets, all his people, they were... If you skip over, it says they built high places for Baal in the valley of Ben Hinnom and they sacrificed their sons and their daughters to Molech. And what they would do is they would take the, the baby and they would place it on the hands of this statue, Molech, and then they would light it on fire and the baby would cry and it would burn to death. And what, the, what would happen is that the priests would bang on drums and clap their hands to drown out the cries of the baby so that the fathers would not regret their decision. In the same way, we march screaming, my body, my choice, to drown out the lost lives. This is all being repeated in a different way. Priests would say that offering your baby is the greatest sacrifice Today, they say abortion is the greatest form of health care for women. So, whew, I'm trying not to choke up. So, and just as brutal as baby sacrifices were back then, because they were, um, so they are today. I said, I, there's no way as someone who follows God that I could be pro-choice. I understand there's medical inter-, inter um, variances, but we're living in such a different time and we have to not be naive to that. We're living in a time that's repeating Sodom and Gomorrah. We're living in a time where wicked is seen as good and good is seen as wicked. We're living in a different time. This is not the same time. Uh, 
you know, over 20, 30 years ago, maybe um, it wasn't really talked about as much. You know, people desired marriage 50 years ago. They for sure were, you know, more marriages, more successful marriages and less abortions happening. But this is not becoming something else. You know, it's not becoming a rare case. It's being normalized. It's being pushed. It's so you have things like the DNC abortion, which uses a suction machine and it collects its pieces of the baby pieces, not entirely. It's a small, small suction. Uh, DNE abortion is from 13 to 24 weeks and it requires the woman to begin being given anesthesia to block out any pain. And because the baby is too big for the suction machine, they use a clamp and they pull out the, the, um, the, the child like that. And they also put it on like a tray and the abortionist counts all the pieces of the baby to make sure he got everything. So you no know, infection happens to the woman. So he's counting all the body parts. So it's it's pretty gru- it's pretty graphic. It's pretty gruesome, you know, just like how it was when they were doing this as a pagan sacrifice. Um Proverbs 6:16 6, uh, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. And I don't think this is a coincidence that these are all listed with each other. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes. And do you see the deception going on today with all of this? And then feet that are quick to rush to evil. That's That really stand out to me because when I was, I was talking to certain people about this research that I was doing, you always hear, well, what about when they're super young? What about if there was this case, that case? And then you see right here next to hands that shed innocent blood, it says feet that are quick to rush to evil. Why is that the first thing we think about? I understand that it's thought about. I understand that was brought, you know, up as a possibility. But why is that the first thing that we rush to? Why is that what people scream the loudest? Well, they, this happened to them, so we're going to do this. We should have, be allowed to do this. Where's resources? <laughs> Where's help? Where's psychologists coming in to try to evaluate the situation, see what we can do? Can we give the baby over to a home where it's not linked to the trauma of this child, that it can go to a family that will love this child and adore this child? And if you hear cases from people who have gone through a traumatic situation, their parent went through a traumatic situation and they were adopted or they, you know, parent decided to keep them, they are so grateful and they're so happy to be here today. And I would really recommend you go look into those stories. They're beautiful, beautiful testimonies. Again, this this has been going on for 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 many, many years for centuries, where that the Satan always went after babies, went after the children. The king had all these all these children killed, right to stop the Messiah. He didn't. He didn't succeed. And so this has always been a tactic to try to stop prophets from coming out into the world, testimonies from happening. And lastly, why should we talk about this? Why can't we just stay quiet? You know, I even asked God that myself. Why do I have to bring this up, God? You know, um, people should know and they can find it out from someone else. They can find it out. There's so many platforms. There's so many other people talking about this. Why do I have to be the one sharing anything? I don't want to offend people. It says, Proverbs 31, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. It's commanded of us to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. And I understand those that are pro-life. I understand those platforms, why they do do what they do. And if it wasn't for them as well, I wouldn't even have gone in and done my own research. So I want to thank people that are using their platform to talk about this. It's it, Again, once again, it's a triggering conversation for a lot of people. It's a sensitive topic for some people. And I know that people think they're doing what is right and what is best, but this is why we have the word of God because it gives us direction of what is the truth and how and which way to go because our hearts can deceive us. Our hearts can deceive us and we can believe we're doing something right, but there is a wicked scheme and a plot right under it. We can stand back and not say anything, and then a genocide is happening right in front of us. And because we never voiced out and tried, we just let things crash and burn. So thank you for having your ears open for this conversation. I know it is such such a difficult thing to talk about, but please, you know, do more research. You can go in and dig deeper on the things I'm talking about, read some scriptures. But with this presidential election coming up, I think that the biggest thing is that if you are a believer, you are, you are walking with Christ and you are going back and forth on what to do and being 
swayed because you're being told this is women's health care, this is good for women, go this direction. I know that there's division happening. It's made very clear there is division happening, okay? That they want us to be divided. They want us to be apart. They want us to not like each other. They want believers to not like each other. They want people to not like each other because you're voting for this person, you're voting for that person. It's clear as day. And although I might voice my political beliefs a little bit, I know that division is happening. And so I do want to start using this platform to share the word a little bit more and and bring to light what I believe God wants us to do. So I love everybody. <laughs> and thank you guys for tuning in and watching. So if you guys enjoyed today's session, you guys can click here to watch another episode. If you guys want to experience one-on-one -on -one coaching with me where I really help people who do struggle with BPD, do struggle with femininity, and do have relationship issues, you guys can click the link in my bio on my YouTube or on my Instagram bio to my pillar link and you guys will find one-on-one -on -one sessions. I also have ebooks such as How to Magnify the King and Your Husband and I'm the Prize Said Who, which are both self-reflection ebooks that have really saved and helped marriages. 